Okay, so we're really going to focus, and I think it's appropriate uh, for this group, on the question of um, what, what we have learned over the last few years of attempting to apply the theory of procedural justice and legitimacy in, in this, the, the expertise of these panelists will span courts and in police departments. And we're also going to ask, try to push ourselves to ask the question, what, what are the big things we still want to know? Or what do we think the big questions are for the next couple of years? What do we still want to learn? So we're very, very privileged to have a great group of folks here today. We're going to have Tom Tyler start us off. He's the Macklin Fleming Professor of Law and a Professor of Psychology at Yale. Um, he, if uh, you all caught this article from uh, The Guardian from just today, The Simple Idea That Can Transform U.S. Criminal Justice, um, he is credited in this article and many others with having a really developed idea of procedural justice. He's going to explain to us the theory um, and then we're going to move to a group of folks who are going to talk to us about how they have worked to actually apply that theory to improve uh, criminal justice operations in different parts of the country and in different parts of the system. So from Tom, we will move to Greg Berman. He's the director of the Center for Court Innovation. I'm going to keep the bios here extremely brief. You have them all in your packets. Um, I want to move straight to these folks and their great work. Uh, then we have Bruce Lipman, recently retired from the Chicago Police Department, where he was a lieutenant and uh, one of the folks who led the charge in implementing procedural justice training in that department. Um, we will move to Ron Serpas, who is uh, formerly of the New Orleans Police Department and now a professor at Loyola University in New Orleans. Uh, and then we will finish out with Daniela Gilbert, who is the Deputy Director of the California Partnership for Safe Communities. Uh, we have also committed to ourselves that we will be relatively brief and that we want to take a lot of questions because we imagine that many of you are thinking about how to implement these ideas in your own jurisdictions and we'd like to offer as much help we c as we can uh, as you embark on that process. So we'll start with Tom. Yeah. Okay, well, I will be brief because I'm very interested in hearing what the people on the panel who are actually implementing these ideas have to say. As you probably know, I have the background of being an academic. I just heard that's not a good self-description, but <laughs> I spent many, many years doing research with the goal of demonstrating that these ideas are really important. I definitely remember the first time that a police chief came to me and said, okay, you've got all this research, you've convinced me, so now I want to do this, what do I do? And like a typical academic, I stood there like a deer in the headlights thinking, well, it never actually occurred to me that I would have to like have a training program or have an actual policy or practice that I would recommend to people. I was just doing all this research to show that these ideas were important. So I'm very excited that we have really good people who have been doing those things, the things that we really need to do to make this not just a good idea, but an actual doable thing that we can use to improve our courts and improve our police forces. I think the main point from my perspective is we can gain a lot if we can create a situation where the people we're dealing with trust us. And because they trust us, they grant us discretionary authority, they accept our decisions, they're generally more willing to follow laws and less be engaged in criminal behavior, and they cooperate. They actually want to help. So the question is, how can we achieve that? We know from the research I just mentioned that we can achieve that when people feel that they do have trust in police officers, judges, whatever authority they're dealing with, mayors. So the question is, how do we get that? And fortunately, we know a lot about that, too. Now we know that that's really a question of procedural justice. 
that if we go out and look at people on the street when they deal with the police or go to court, the thing that really matters to them is if they do or don't feel that they got procedural justice. Not that they won or lost, not that they did or didn't get a ticket, but that they got a fair exercise of authority. So we know what we need to be focused on. And that's where these training programs come in. That's where design of institutions like the courts come in. So I'll just make two general points, and then we'll hear more about that. One is we're fortunate on this particular panel to have people who do work on the courts and the police. I think it's really important not to think that this is only about the police. A few years back, the state of California, their court system developed a procedural justice initiative. And one of the things that they did that I thought was really very intelligent is they treat the entire process of the first contact with the police officer through pretrial detention, bail hearings, going to court, going to prison, whatever, as a long process that has a series of opportunities for people to get fair or unfair treatment. And they recognize that fair or unfair treatment at any one of those points has an impact on people. What we would ideally like to have is we would like to have a common philosophy through the whole system. The police are a, t a very common focus because they're the, the contact point with the public. In a study that we did, a national study, 85% of the contact that people have with criminal justice is with the police. So the police are the natural focus of people's relationship to government. And so we tend to focus on the police, but I think it's also important to recognize that all of these different stages are important if we want to achieve the goal of trust and confidence in the legal system and compliance with the law. The other thing that I think is an important point to make is a point that was made very briefly this morning, and that is originally almost all of the focus of procedural justice was on training people to deal with the public in ways that the public would experience as fair. And there's a lot of evidence, as I said, that this is good, that if the public feels fairly treated, a lot of good things happen that help the system. But we have come to recognize, as we have talked more about this as a system level issue, that we can't ignore the issue of the internal dynamics of different organizations where law enforcement people work. The court system, the police department. We find that it's very hard to convince police officers that they should be fair to people out on the street if they don't feel that they get fairly treated in their station house. If they don't feel like their sergeant listens to them, explains anything, is trustworthy, cares about their well-being, telling them to do all those things out on the street when they deal with the public is a hard sell. But conversely, we find that if people do experience those things in their station house, they naturally do those things out on the street. So we can connect feeling that you're in a fair work organization for police officers to behaving in fairer ways to public on the street to being less likely to use force in interacting with the public. So I think we should always try to keep in mind that procedural justice is not just about customers. It's about the internal dynamics of the system as well. So having said those things, I'm eager to hear what the people who are actually implementing these ideas in the courts and in the police force are doing. Hey, uh, it's great to be here. Um, I want to start with a confession, as I always like to start all remarks with confessions, even though I'm Jewish. Um, and the confession is that, of course, just about everything that I know about procedural justice, I learned from Tom Tyler. Uh, I learned from the great Emily Gold Grotta. Emily, raise your hand. Flock to her afterwards. She is our kind of in-house expert on procedural justice. Um, so 
with that caveat in mind, uh, <clears throat> I run an organization called the Center for Court Innovation that's trying to reform the justice system, and, and we do a couple of different things. We perform original research, we go out and we do consulting work um, around the country and across the world, but I think what we're best known for is our work here in New York where we create demonstration projects, each of which is trying to test a, a new approach to justice, a new idea about the delivery of justice. And this has included um, anti-violence programs, youth development programs, specialized courts. But I think the reason I got invited here today is that we have created a, a series of community justice centers across uh, New York City and also in Newark, which was featured in the Guardian article um, that Megan referenced earlier, um, that are trying, these are neighborhood-based courthouses that are trying to um, reduce crime, reduce the use of incarceration, uh, and improve public trust and justice. And, um, and really, in some ways, I think, are embodiments of, of the idea of procedural justice. And um, uh, two years ago, the National Center for State Courts and John Jay College actually performed an evaluation of one of our programs, the Red Hook Community Justice Center, and found that uh, Red Hook had actually reduced reoffending among both juveniles and adult offenders, and which was cool, and we of course trumpeted that to the world, but what was really exciting was that the hypothesis of the research team was that they, the reason behind this reduction in, in reoffending was a, in effect a, a procedural justice effect, that the types of interventions, we were working with minor offenders, uh, primarily misdemeanor offenders, and we were linking them to very short-term interventions, two days of community service, participation in a, in a couple of counseling sessions, not the kinds of interventions that you would expect to have a life transforming effect on someone. And the operating hypothesis of the research team was that the reason we had been able to change the behavior of participants was that they felt better about the justice system. And part of the research, which was performed by professors at John Jay, was actually uh, ethnographic research interviewing hundreds of defendants who had been both before the regular downtown Brooklyn Criminal Court and the Red Hill Community Justice Center. And I want to just read one quote from, from their research, which I thought was representative. This is an interview with, with a defendant. I went to Brooklyn Criminal Court before I went to the Red Hill Community Justice Center. It's a horrible place, horrible. They should do a tour there just so people could see. I wouldn't wish that place on my, on my worst enemy. Red Hook is 100 times better. The Red Hook judge allows you to speak. He likes to interact and get your opinion. I don't get the feeling that he's one of those judges that looks down on people. To me, he's fair, I'll put it that way. The court officers treat you like a person too, not like that other court. I learned there's two different types of ways that courts treat people. You have these obnoxious goons, and then you have those that look at you like, okay, you made a mistake. So for me, the, the money line here is really the courts treat you like people. Uh, and that's kind of the, the, when you reduce it to its nub, that's what we're trying to do in, in all of our programs. Um, we're trying to encourage the justice system, whether it be police, prosecutors, defense, uh, probation, courts, um, to treat people like people um, and bolster the legitimacy of the, of the system in the process. So what I wanted to offer, um, I came up with seven lessons. I couldn't come up with 10, I ran out of steam. I came up with seven <laughs> lessons that we've learned from doing this work over the last two decades. Um, and I wanted to just quickly run through them, because um, I think they're appropriate. To, again, my experience comes primarily out of the courts, but I think it's appropriate for any agency that's interested in doing this work. And I apologize in advance if some of these are obvious, um, uh, but they are the lessons I came up with. Okay, lesson number one. Uh, and that's about the importance of mission and messaging around mission. So all of our written materials about for example, the Red Hill Community Justice Center, include the phrase that what we're trying to do is improve public trust in justice. There can be no mistake, I hope, of any of the people that work in that building or come into contact with that program of what the program is trying to do. And we hit that drum, we bang that drum every time we go out in public, we hit that drum in all of our written materials and social media, et cetera, and I think that that's enormously important. Clarity about mission and, and messaging it over and over again. So that's lesson number one. Lesson number two, this was something I was talking about with Tom before the panel. A kinder, gentler version of the status quo is not enough to move the needle. Um, you, you can't just do what you've always done a little bit nicer. 
Um, you actually have to change practice if you want to change people's opinion. Um, and the most obvious example in Red Hook was that we were able to show that we had reduced the, the, the use of incarceration. We were sending 35% less people, fewer people to jail um, when compared to comparable offenders who went go through the, the Brooklyn regular criminal courthouse. And that's enormously important because there is a large segment of the population, at least the population in the neighborhoods where we work, that wants to know that the entire apparatus of the criminal justice system is not a you know, one-way track that leads to incarceration. And so we were able to demonstrate that, if not just with words, but with our deeds. Uh, third lesson, and this is something that I've really come to believe in very strongly as I've gotten older, architecture matters. <clears throat> so you can send messages through your program and messages through your words. Nonverbal messages matter just as much, if not more. And so we designed this facility in a way to communicate procedural justice, or as, as good as we could come up with at the time. Uh, and we did a number of important tweaks that I think reinforced the, the actual programmatic work of the Red Oak Community Justice Center. Uh, for example, the holding cells have no bars in them. We used treated glass instead of bars. So it took away one of the most powerful and powerfully negative symbols of the justice system. Uh, we elevated the bench of the judge a little bit, but not so much that the judge is kind of looking down the top of the heads of defendants, but looking them in the eye. And these are subtle um, changes, but as David Kennedy, I think, referenced yesterday, sometimes these subtle changes can have huge impacts. Uh, lesson number four, um, and that's about the importance of creating both formal and informal mechanisms of engagement with the public. We have done things like community conditions panels and, and call-ins and um, neighborhood advisory groups. They're all great, we should do them. I'm telling you, in terms of my own feelings, and this is not based on empirical data, but in terms of my own feelings about what work has the most impact, it is the parties, the toy drives, the Little League Baseball, um, the opportunities that we create for informal interaction between justice system professionals and the public matter just as much, if not more, than the formal task forces and advisory groups. <clears throat> Lesson number five, and I won't dwell on this because my sense is that other people on the panel will talk about this, is just you have to invest in training. Um, it's hard to ask people to engage uh, with the public without giving them the tools to do it. Uh, and it also, I believe that that message and that training has to go through an agency. So in, in the case of our work with the Midtown Community Court or the Red Community Justice Center or Brownsville Community Justice Center, the other programs that we operate, we're not putting all the onus on the judge. We want everybody to feel like they have their responsibility is to engage with the public. Um, similarly, lesson number six, I am coming to the end. Uh, lesson number six is invest in research. Uh, one of the things that we've done in our neighborhood-based work is do periodic door-to-door uh, -door surveys with the public, asking them how they feel about their neighborhood, asking them how they feel about public safety, asking them how they feel about local justice institutions. Uh, we do it every couple of years. And through that door-to-door -door survey work, we were able to document profound shifts in public sentiment about the justice system. Before we opened our doors in Red Hook, only 12% of the local residents um, viewed local courts positively. Our most recent door-to-door -door survey, which is now a couple years old, 94% uh, of people um, approved of the job that the Justice Center was doing. So it's not exactly an apples-to-apples -apples comparison, but it is an indication that we have changed, we've moved the, the needle in terms of how people are thinking about uh, local justice institutions. And then finally, um, and this is just um, I'm a big believer in humility. My final lesson is the importance of modest expectations. Uh, the kinds of results that David was talking about and others have talked about, 50% reductions in homicide, those are great and we should obviously strive to achieve those. But the, the levels of distrust that we're dealing with in some of the neighborhoods in which we work are so profound it's taken us generations to get to that level of distrust. We're not going to turn that ship around overnight. Um, and this was communicated to me most powerfully. We had a 10th anniversary 
celebration at the Red Hill Community Justice Center. And so uh, it had taken us six years of planning to open our doors, and then we had been open for 10 years. We had a little celebration, and one of the key local um, activists, a guy named Wally, who ran a group called Mad Dads of Red Hook, came up to me at the 10th anniversary, and he said, you know, I, I finally feel like maybe you're for real. And my jaw just dropped because it's like, oh my God, Wally, I've known you for 16 years. We've been working in this neighborhood doing good things for 16 years and only now you think that my organization is for real? But that's, I, I think while it was depressing for me, I think that Wally was speaking for a, a significant segment of the population that just has, feels like they've been lied to and misled for a long, long time. And if we are going to radically transform the relationship between the justice system and communities, my um, cautionary note is that I don't think that happens overnight. I think that that is a generational shift that we're going to be talking about. But I also believe that nothing could be more important. Okay, so you guys all heard today, most of you were in with, with the beginning opening session, so you kind of know the, the backstory of, of the training in Chicago. And I think we developed, I think, and I say we, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, but we developed a training that's both effective and that the police officers like. And in terms of education, if, if your students like the training, they're much more likely to uh, listen and pay attention and get something out of it. But I want to, the two most important things I want to talk about what we've learned in terms of this implementation of this training is a couple things. We are out ahead of Ferguson. We were way out ahead of Ferguson. And when Ferguson happened, and then the, the, it seemed like after that, just like every month, there was something new going on with, with, with a, a, a black man or, or, or a person of color being shot by the police. Um, the call started to come in. Uh, you know, just pouring in on us. And everybody wanted procedural justice training. And one of the lessons I take away from this is that it cannot be training is just the beginning. There's all kinds of departments now who want to go to their mayors or go to their city councils and say, oh, we're doing procedural justice training, and we call it checking the box. Hey, we checked the box, we did the training. And in conjunction with that is the other thing is it has to be uh, culturalized into the department. And Tom, Tom said it perfectly. If the officers go to roll call and they're, they feel like the department that they're working for is not using the uh, tenets of procedural justice, if they're not being treated fairly, if they're not being respected, I can't even tell you how many officers that we've trained who feel that they're not being treated fairly, they're not being respected by their own, their own department, their own peers. If they're not being listened to and genuinely listened to, if there's no trust established there, and you can't ask someone to go out in the street, I don't care what job it is. This is cross. I, I teach management classes, and I teach this in management. Every employee, every worker wants this. They want to be treated fairly. They want to be treated respectfully. They want to be listened to. And they want a trust. Loyalty has to be two-way street. So the two things that, to me, are the biggest things that we have to do going forward is training is just the beginning. And if you're going to do the training, your department better be prepared to take a hard look at itself and are you going to culturalize uh, the training into your department. And to me, you can culturalize it fairly easy. First of all, how you pick and select your, your supervisors as a part of your promotion test. Do you add the four words, the four tenets into your mission statement? How hard would it be to add into your mission statement that whatever we do, we're going to do it fairly, we're going to do it respectfully, we're going to listen to people, and we're going to hopefully develop trust. Um, are you rewarding? Are you recognizing people who are doing procedural justice? Are you giving a pat and back? We give all kinds of awards out for people who do who valorous things. And God bless them. If you, know, uh, if you run into a burning building, if you're in a shootout with someone, you should get a, a awards for that, for valor. But what about rewarding the guys and, and the girls who are, uh, you gotta be, I'm, I'm from Chicago, everyone's a guy, I'm sorry. Um, you got to reward those people and recognize those people who are doing it because if you recognize them, you'll get more of that same behavior. Uh, and going back a little bit, when I say we, the partnership that we worked with, and it was a real partnership with um, Tom and Tracy to develop this, and I think it's, it may be very unique in terms of police uh, training. Uh, when, when, my, 
uh, Al Ferrara, who's a police officer I worked with, uh, who worked for me as a lieutenant when I was at the academy, we both went to Yale, and we had both been studying, we have been reading things. I started out with a one-inch binder because I still like reading paper. And it turned into like a five or six-inch binder by the time I was done, or reading books and, and all this stuff. And then we get the opportunity, and thanks to the National Network, and it was Su Lin Wong who actually set up the trip to uh, Yale so that we could sit with Tom and Tracy. So we were excited to go to go list, to listen to Tom and Tracy, who were the two, you know, the people who we were reading all these things about, along with Donald Sunshine, but, you know, Tom and Tracy. And at the same time, we're going to Yale University, and we were two coppers from the south side of Chicago. So, I mean, you can imagine a couple things. We're like thinking, geez, I wonder, uh, you know, are they like communist, pinko, hippie, you know, what, what's going on? You know, this is Yale, guys. This is the East Coast. And, and the one thing I will take away, and I think I can speak for Al, too, is that um, Tom and Tracy were so gracious and so patient and so willing to share their information with us that it made it easy. And we've been working on it for a few months doing research. We had about a 350 PowerPoint presentation, and we went in, and by the time we left, I instinctively knew we had about two days worth of material when we left to implement. And we did Procedural Justice 1, and as you heard, we're doing Procedural Justice 2, and some of the things from that meeting um, are in Procedural Justice 2. So that meeting led to two um, training programs going on. And uh, like I said, Tom and Tracy were so gracious and, and so uh, just not what we expected, but not what we expected in such a great way that, I mean, they're like our heroes. We write their names on the boards, we do training, we have Tom's name up there and Tracy's name up there, and, and I should include Wes Scogan, who, we did, uh, who, who, did a, uh, who did the study to see if they were learning anything, and, and uh, Dennis, Rosenbaum, uh, Dennis Rosenbaum from University of Illinois Chicago. So we write all their names up there, and it lets the officers know that this is not just a couple cops who made this stuff up, that this is actual scientifically proven things. The other thing is, and I'm going to finish up, but the other thing when we did the training is when we brought it back from, from Yale, one of the things we needed to do was make sure that it was relatable to the police. I call it the WIFM factor. What's in it for me? And the whole training was based around what is in it for the police officer so that when they go out on the street, they can take this with them. And, and they always said, well, our boss and, and this and that in the community. But we, what we wanted to bring to them was something that they could use. And it didn't matter who the superintendent was, who the community was, who their supervisor was. This is something that will help you do your job better and be more safe and take that out in the street with them. Well, we really believe it. When I read these things, after I was a 26-year veteran at the time, and I read procedural justice, and at first I'm thinking, oh, legitimacy, here's some more bullshit that, you know, we're, now we're not legitimate, you know. And um, I, I think it's one of the best things to happen for police officers. I think that helps the community, but I think it's just wonderful for police officers. And the last thing, and then I'm going to shut up, is to pick your trainers. And I was fortunate that I picked my trainers. All my trainers did not come from the academy. About half of them I took, I took from the street. And the police officers I took had to be legitimate themselves. They had to, they had to be police, police, police officers, policemen. They had to believe in this to begin with, and then I could teach them how to teach. And we had a phenomenal training crew, and this would not have been possible, this would not have taken off the way it did if it was not for that training crew with, with Al and Ray and Mike and Mike and Mark and, and Jose and Tramel and Dina and a couple of the other ones I'm, I'm probably forgetting right now. But they made this work. They stood in front of a classroom of veteran officers who had their arms folded, like, you know, what is this legitimacy bullshit? And they took, them, and they took those officers and they turned them around as David talked about today, and that was huge. So I'm going to leave it at that for right now, and you know, if you guys have questions, please ask questions, and if I have some more comments later on, if you have time, I'll, I'll tell you some more things about it. But uh, you know, hopefully you all have a lot of questions you can ask, and we'll leave you enough time to do that. Well, good afternoon. Um, so I can tell you who doesn't operate in a just way, Southwest Airlines. <laughs> they don't care what they do, they don't care who they do it to, and they'll never explain why they did it to you. I just found out my plane is going to be 10 minutes late connecting in St. Louis, so we're going to be putting some justice on them. Um, please excuse me, I'm from New Orleans, I don't speak good. Um, we have another Louisiana native in here, thank goodness the DA from Baton Rouge is here so he can you know, translate if he needs to. I came into academia in a much different way at a much later point in life. I've been on the faculty of Loyola University in New Orleans since August. Before that though, and I'm still a recovering police chief. I was a police chief for 14 years. I was the chief of the Washington State Patrol in 2001, chief of Nashville, Tennessee in 2004, chief of New Orleans, Louisiana in 2010, and then retired from all policing in August of uh, 2014. And really, to be honest with you, not so much from the perspective of officer training and all those things, 
I do believe that the first exposure I had to this concept of um, selling the stock, the Washington State Troopers would train themselves and they had this concept and it was on every wall, it was in every room, it was in all the dorms and it was sell the stop, sell the stop, sell the stop. So you can imagine I'm just a, a kid from New Orleans looking up to see water and they're like mountains everywhere. And I kept asking the instructors, I said, what does this sell the stop thing mean? And they said, well, chief, you know, troopers are by themselves. And what we're trying to train them is that if they use their brains, if they talk to people, if they treat people with some dignity and respect, they're less likely to have to fight folk. So in other words, the way the troopers approached it wasn't from this very well thought out theory that Professor Tyler has, which has become a complete guiding principle for me in the last several years. Uh, it was as a process of making sure that they were safe and they were making each other safe. And I watched that develop. And during the two and a half, three years I was chief in Washington, our troopers did out, went out and did more work than they had done in the last 20 years. They doubled the numbers of DWI arrests. Fatality accidents on the interstate system went down 22%. They you know, doubled the numbers of traffic stops. They did all these things that would make you intuitively think, oh my goodness, the public is not going to support them because they are out here doing more than they ever did. Turned out to be exactly opposite. The University of Washington used to do routine polling of satisfaction of trooper behavior. And there's a quote in one of their last findings when I was chief that says essentially, despite the dramatic and continuing increase in the trooper activity on the roadway, resulting in arrests and citations, the rate at which people approve of Washington State Troopers has gone up. It kind of caught the researchers by surprise. We went to Nashville, and I kept that sell to stop thing in our head, and we kept talking about sell to stop. We started in Nashville, Tennessee, polling the public every six months with a professional surveying firm. I like academics, you like academics, but the work takes too long, and they often want to ask their questions and not the questions we wanted. So we paid a professional polling firm. And I want you to know that I'm very proud to tell you that the 10 years I was a chief in a major city, we were polling the public every six months. And in those polls, we were, we were beginning to back into this whole idea. Every one of those polls asked, was the officer respectful? Did the officer treat you with dignity? What was your overall satisfaction with the service? And what we kind of bumped into without even knowing it, if you look at the National Police Research Platform that Dennis is doing that I'm glad to be a board member of, he created an index or elements of procedural justice for the first time that I know of that's actually been tested by police, tested on police officers, if you will. This is a uh, citizen satisfaction survey contact card from 100 representative sample departments in the country. And the index for procedural justice are terms such as respectful, helpful, competence, unbiased, trustworthy, empathy, victim assistance, not blame. And the rate at which people think these are contact cards that they sent back in after a police officer was dispatched to their house to handle a crime involved in an automobile accident or a traffic stop across the country. The New Orleans Police Department was one of the agencies. That's why I have this data. And Dennis said, well, if you want to release it, you can do whatever you want with it. So here it is. You just saw it. And what we found is that we began able to clearly communicate to the police officers. In New Orleans, during the time I was superintendent, we had no money. The city went absolutely completely broke. We lost 500 police officers out of 1,500. That's about a third, if you're doing the math. And what we used to try to tell the officers is that, look, I don't have to find special training funds to teach you how to be respectful to people. We don't have to find the special training funds to teach you that if you talk to people in a courteous way, the chances of you going home and them going home is much better. But what really tipped the scale for me was the personal experiences I had as the chief in these different departments. And if you've been a chief of any department, or if you've been a chief of the three departments I was, there are crises that occur. In Washington State, one of our troopers had to shoot a woman on a traffic stop in front of her five-year-old child. In Nashville, we had a series of events where young men had died involved with the police. In New Orleans, in February 14, just a few months before Ferguson, we had literally an identical type of discharge of a firearm similar to Ferguson. But what I'll share with you is that in not one of those cities did we have significant overflow of anger in the community. I don't know all the reasons why, but when I started reading Tom's work more carefully and saw that piece, right, the three key things that if you do justice correctly, you get the legitimacy, the three key things, Obeying the law, willing to assist, and here's the money shot, willing to defer to police judgment, or willing to defer to your judgment. 
And we started thinking about that. And then on that Sunday in February 2014 where we had that shooting, myself and the field commander of that unit were in the crowd, 200, 250 people, and they were being told all kinds of things that happened that didn't happen. But that particular neighborhood, I do believe to this day, had actually read Tom's work. <laughs> because they were willing to take a chance. And that community said, you know, no matter what we're hearing right now, same, same narrative, person was on the ground, shot, you know, all these crazy things that people say, by and large, by the way, unless you, don't say this in public because you'll get beat up in a bar room, but by and large what they say on television they never saw, right? And that's the same thing that happened here. But that neighborhood was willing to take a chance, and they waited. And we had the same thing happen in Nashville. Officers chased someone, they expired, the family wanted to start out an outbreak of violence in the community, and the community said, you know, we kind of trust this police department right now. Just take a deep breath, and we'll see what's going to happen. So I think that's what I tried to do with the departments. The 14 years I was a chief, the 13 years I was a chief, was to keep using these ideas. And to the, to the last two points I'll make, while I am former vice president of the Police Chief Association, I am the current chair of the Community Policing Committee, uh, for fear of my committee bolting on me, justice and legitimacy underpins all of that stuff. Right? A lot of people do just uh, community policing. We can talk a lot about community policing, but at the end of the day, some departments can choose not to do it. I don't think any department cannot choose to accept justice. I don't think they get to say, that's not a philosophy we can afford to do. I think they need to do it. It's the most important thing. And just like in community policing, we used a medical model, medical model, model if you remember back in the 90s, to explain it. And the medical model was, well, community policing is kind of like your family practitioner, whereas the emergency room triage is kind of like answering the radio. So when I started talking to police officers about this uh, justice and legitimacy, I tried to put it into a different framework. And I said, let me ask you all something. I said, I'm over 50 years old now. I don't ever, ever go to the doctor and hear anything I want to hear. <laughs> ever. You eat too much, you're too fat, you drink too much, you're going to die, your arteries are clogged up. And why do I change my behavior? Because at some point, I believe that person's making decisions with me that are in the best interest of me. You know that's true when they come at you with those big tubes and stuff that they want to inspect your innermost parts. <laughs> People don't do that unless they're willing to throw themselves over to that expertise. That's the message we try to give the cops. You know, bedside manner's been in the medical profession for thousands of years. And probably a lot of those years it was there just to try to hold people steady long enough so we could try to help them in a way that they just did not want to do. So the justice and legitimacy thing, we pulled on it. We ended up asking the same questions that Dennis and a lot of really smart people asked. We've got 10 years of data from Nashville and New Orleans, and it continues to point that it's great to be able to say that 80 plus percent of the people in Nashville thought that the Nashville Police Department was competent. That's a question that's asked that they were respectful, that's a question that's asked. But, although I'm a half full kind of guy, you gotta be half empty on this, because that still means 20% didn't get that feeling, right? So put that this way. Tom makes a brilliant point in his writing when he says no matter how much we've advanced policing in the last 30 years, we've not advanced the needle of public support. We're still hovering between 50 and 60% of public support. That's a lot better than a lot of other institutions, particularly a lot of institutions that criticize American policing. In fact, we do better than all the institutions that criticize American policing in the sense of people thinking we can get our job done fairly well. But we still have a huge number that think we can, and here's how I think we can explain that to our officers. If there's 800,000 cops in America, let's take 100,000 off for federal agents, which is way bigger than what they are. But let's just work with the number 700,000. There's 700,000 sheriff's deputies, police officers, and troopers in America. If the Gallup organization is right on their polling, and they tend to be pretty well respected, any workforce in America, February 2013, they released this data after looking at 24 million workplace surveys of satisfaction. Got it? I spit that out really quick. That's a technical, law, uh, technical professor stuff. 2013, December, Gallup released the results of looking at 24 million surveys of workplace satisfaction. Gallup says, this is their data, not mine, Gallup says that 20% of the American workforce is described this, under this term, actively disengaged. Gallup goes on to define actively disengaged is 20% of your workforce is coming there to destroy the workplace. 
They are angry. They are bitter. They have crappy lives. They don't want to be part of success, and they want to destroy everything around them in the workplace. That's what Gallup said, not me. As a chief, I happen to think they're probably true. So let's go back to it. We have 700,000 police officers in America. If we're like Gallup, we got 140,000 of them aren't getting this message. We have 140,000 of them out there making mistakes every day in the work that we do. So my, my caution to police chiefs is even though it feels good to know that when I was in Nashville, 80% of the people supported us. When we was in New Orleans, believe it or not, in 2009, 33% of the people supported the NOPD in August of 2009. In August of 2014, 66% of the people supported the New Orleans Police Department. Still means we got a third that don't. Still means we got a lot of room to improve. So I don't know that community policing is and should continue to be discussed as the only and best solution. I think we ought to start with justice and legitimacy first and make that the basis of everything we do. And then after that, it seems to me, community policing starts to make a lot more sense as a possibility, the court systems, the prosecution systems, et cetera. Thank you. Hi, folks. Oh, I don't know who's closer. Um, so just for a bit of context, um, as Megan mentioned, I work for an organization called the California Partnership for Safe Communities, and we work with cities on a version of the Group Violence Reduction Strategy, or ceasefire, with an attention to trust building work. So um, in the context of doing partnership-based violence intervention, this issue of trust emerged as a prominent one to work on. And um, what I'd like to talk about today is just a few takeaways from adapting Chicago's curriculum to the California cities that we work with. And then also some benefits of doing that in partnership with community. Um, uh, Pastor Ben McBride, who spoke yesterday morning, was one of the lead instructors. So just a few takeaways up around developing training in partnership with community and then to, to the question about where do we go from here, some ideas around that. Um, so Bruce mentioned the importance of instructor qualifications, which was something that was really important in thinking about how to adapt this training um, and make it work in a department. So um, buy-in and having instructors who are credible to the agency was really important because they became kind of the internal faces of the, of the content for the department. So that was very important. Um, uh, executive and command staff support, chief supporting it so that um, it was clear that this wasn't just kind of a formulaic in service training, but that it was really part of a broader interest and intention to elevate procedural justice in the agency. Um, and then uh, lastly, and um, we mentioned this this morning, the training was really well received across all the departments that did it. So. Um, it's, it isn't, the curriculum is very well designed um, with a lot of input from academics and officers and the instruction is not experienced as corrective. It really affirms um, what a lot of officers already do and recalibrates around um, the benefits and values of treating people with respect and giving them voice, conveying neutrality and trustworthiness. Um, so uh, as, we, as we engaged in the training process in Oakland, the, um, the ceasefire partnership there had, had been working on um, violence reduction and trust building, and the training itself was actually a, a real concrete step in the right direction in terms of moving from you know, intention or commitment to action. And a few benefits of working uh, with community partners on the training um, emerged. So one was the, the quality of the training. So Chicago did a lot to make the training relevant to their department and in thinking about how you adapt the content of a training to another community um, involving the recipients of police services in the design of the curriculum really ensured um, quality and, um, and specificity to, to that community. So uh, folks did things like finding archival footage of um, police community relations doing uh, man on the street interviews and thinking about um, thinking about really how you make this Oakland specific so that it's not perceived as something kind of coming in from the outside. So the kind of customization of the training was one strength. Another was um, there's a module in the training about um, the uh, history of policing in the US and the impact of um, police being used to enforce racist policies on relationships between communities of color and um, the police that serve them. And uh, the community partners in the, in the ceasefire partnership taught that module. And that offered um, a few important things. So 
One was, um, you know, it was, it was playing out procedural justice in the context of the training, so giving um, voice and respect to the lived experience of community um, recipients of policing. Another um, was that it, it really created a rare opportunity and um, an appetite for more of this, of dialogue around these issues um, in, in a context that was honest and that built on the importance of the procedural justice values throughout the, the day so that um, the community instructor didn't just kind of drop in, talk, and leave, but it was really a partnership throughout the day, though he only focused on this one module. Um, and then the, the last benefit was that the evaluations of the course uh, in every session, there was um, kind of positive experience of having this interaction and desire for more of these types of interactions, both in a training context and in terms of ongoing dialogue with community uh, actors. And so this, this appetite for interacting, not just in the context of um, you know, of responding to a call, but really having an ongoing dialogue with community partners who who uh, care about policing in their community. Um, the um, the community partnership also helped with the violence reduction work. So, um, as I mentioned, kind of thinking about trust and crime reduction hand in hand, the training was a, was a way to build those working relationships and strengthen the violence reduction work. So um, in a situation that was characterized with some distrust but shared values and goals around reducing violence, working together actually helped overcome some of that and led to some positive outcomes around um, the reductions in shootings and homicides. Um, and then lastly, involving the community really uh, enhanced the credibility of the training in the eyes of the community and helped uh, cultivate um, what you might call critical champions, so folks who are really committed to supporting the police department and advocating for a procedurally just way of working while also helping uh, kind of hold the banner of continued progress around this. Um, so in thinking about um, what to do beyond the training um, and kind of where to go in, in moving procedural justice into practice, um, to, to the points on the other side of the panel, so far the focus really has been around training and um, introducing these ideas that are you know, endemic to policing, um, but at the same time realizing that you, uh, there are ways that you can support and you can um, help officers do this by addressing specific practice issues. Um, and so far, in the cities that we work with in California, the group violence reduction work has been the primary um, application of procedural justice. So, um, so thinking about the strategy, in addition to being focused deterrence, actually thinking about it uh, as a procedural justice strategy, both in terms of the way that the Collins and direct communication works, but also in the kind of partnership-based policing model, including um, including respect and voice and neutrality, thinking about it not just in, in delivering it to the, um, the high-risk people that you're trying to prevent crime among, but also the community partners who are concerned about the safety issue. So um, beyond that, the, the kind of two principles that have emerged are to the point around internal procedural justice um, involving folks who are most involved in the issue in designing the solution and um, thinking about the population where distrust is highest and focusing there to try to achieve impact around crime reduction and changing the relationship among the uh, most distrustful. So the, the place of the, that that has led us is, um, and to David's point this morning, working on homicide scenes as an opportunity for uh, relationship strengthening um, and thinking about the different ways that, uh, that the way officers respond and whether and the role of community members also at those scenes as a trust building opportunity. Um, another piece um, which the ceasefire director Reagan Harmon spoke about on the sustainability panel is incorporating the perspective of um, guys who are part of the intervention into the intervention. So doing um, feedback sessions after call-ins to better understand what the experience uh, was for them, not just around the call-in, but around their experience with the criminal justice system overall. And, um, you know, we have these ideas about not being threatening and treating people with respect, um, but it, it's valuable to actually talk with them about what they're experiencing to determine if that, if, you know, 
could we could we improve on that? And so um, creating using the the violence intervention as an opportunity to engage in an ongoing dialogue with uh, people and networks who are least likely to trust the police, but who, and Tom mentioned this research earlier, generally um, react to react positively to the procedural justice principles like any other person would. And so there's a lot of mileage um, around investing in them in terms of trust building. Um, the other piece that um, that is hopeful, I think, is that we're talking about, in, in the context of police departments, we're talking about change in paramilitary organizations. And so, you know, Bruce talked about culturalization and that um, there are actually real ways to help and incentivize and recognize um, and expect officers to deliver this type of interaction with community, but it, it, does, it likely does require more than an initial training and actual engagement around what policies and practices um, look like. Good. Uh, just real quick, got a couple guys, a couple of trainers from Oakland over here, and because they're cops and I'm I like a cop, got a standoff, we got a message, come on. They're actually from Stockton. Stockton, Stockton. I'm sorry, Stockton, I'm, I'm sorry. So these are a couple of the guys who did the training in Stockton. So. All right, it is entirely not by accident that we have a half hour left. Um, it is not that we wanted you to leave early, although I suppose that is uh, your choice, but we really hope to engage you um, and to hear from you what questions you have as your um, involved in the process of thinking about implementing procedural justice in your organizations. So we have, a, we have two microphones in the audience, or I think we may even just be able to hear you. So please, this is your time to ask us whatever you'd like. Yep. So out of the uh, training that you're doing, is there a community aspect of, of training the community about this procedural justice aspect? And could you tell us where you're from also? I'm sorry, Jeff Clark, uh, I'm out of uh, New York State, we're with the Division of Criminal Justice Services. Um, yeah, so so in the um, in the Oakland context and involving community partners in the training itself, it actually accomplishes that because you've got folks who are who are seeing firsthand um, the training process in the department that can actually message it among their networks and explain explain not only the concept of procedural justice, but what the department is actually doing. So in engaging in that partnership, you develop um, kind of uh, organic advocates for the, for the change work that the department is working on. And in Chicago, we actually took our, the training that we gave police officers, and a lot of the officers were saying, well, you know, it's great that we're getting this, but what about the community? So we actually took the, the six and a half hour training, and it's an all day training. Uh, they get an hour for lunch and, and about a 10 or 15 minute break every you know, 40 or 50 minutes. Uh, and we actually kind of like melted it down to about two hours because with the community, you can't really keep them all day. You can only keep two, three hours. They've all got to go. I, I say go home and watch Matlock. My mom likes Matlock. So, <laughs> uh, so uh, we melted it down and kind of made like about a two and a half hour block. And we've actually done Citizens Police Academies and done some other uh, interactions. We actually brought it out to the, uh, the youth. Uh, there's some youth forums going on we brought it out to. And wherever we took it, you know, we, we kind of modified it, and uh, it worked out great. Uh, so I think, it's, I think it's important that this message does get out to the community more. I think in Chicago, I'm retired now, so I'm not as connected as I, I was, but I think they are starting to roll this out more to the community uh, and, and do the training for the community, too, at least to show them what, the expect, what they should expect from the police, if nothing else, that, hey, listen, you know, you should expect to be treated. You should expect to be treated respectfully and fair. And this is what we're teaching our police officers, which I think is also a good um, marketing tool, for want of a better word, uh, for what you're doing for the departments. Because Lord knows, every police department in the country right now can use uh, a couple good things going for it. So, does that answer your question? Could I also elevate uh, the work of our Stockton partners' point of view, if you're willing to talk about it? I seem to recall, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, that you all had communities sit in on your training, and that you actually had the media sit in on your training. Would you be willing to talk about that? Uh, we did um, a couple of different ways. We trained the media on procedural justice, and then our chief has an advisory board, which is influential people within the community. 
and they went through the training as well, which allowed them to bring it back to uh, all different parts of the community, both North Stockton, South Stockton, East Side, West Side. So it kind of spread out through there. And how was that received? It's been received very well. Now these are the guys who make it go. The trainers are the ones who they, they, they make it go. And having good trainers is is key. Uh, and I will tell you this, Oakland, they came into three days for the academy in Chicago. We gave them a train to trainer and then we actually sent a couple people out to work with them. Um, which model seems, that seems like a really good model. But Oakland, is it Oakland, I'm sorry, Oakland or Stockton? Where they have actually, is Ben in Oakland or Stockton doing a training? In Oakland. In Oakland. They have civilian trainers, you know, community trainers doing the training, which seemed to work there. I don't know that that would have worked as well in Chicago uh, at the time, but I think it shows the adaptability of it. And I think the department should take and adapt it to their own needs. Um, I, uh, where I, I'm, my name is Dan Sparrock, I'm from Baltimore, where I sit in my organization, I'm looking at a lot of different agencies and I'm looking for clear purpose, clear mission, I know what you're responsible for, because I know if you have those things, you'll be able to deliver whatever service you're doing. And this makes a tremendous amount of sense to me because it goes to the bread and butter of the, the service that police and courts deliver. And I'm an attorney by training. Courts are a horrible place for everybody involved. Um, you know, so this, everything about this makes sense. And if I'm a police commissioner and I've got to worry about that 20% of my, of my workforce, uh, I have to conduct trainings that have the word legitimacy in them where half the people in the room are going to need to be sold on the idea. I'm going to need to, and it's, this stuff is important and it's hard, but it's, it's achievable. Like this is, this is really achievable, and, and so I thought this panel would be a good panel to ask the question that's been nagging me throughout this past two days. Is, well, what about all this other stuff? Like, I, I, I'm not so sure when it comes to race and reconciliation whether my department is going to be able to lead the charge on that quite as well as they will on, on this. And I have been, my question has been what, I'm no longer clear on the boundaries and mission of a police organization after we've done everything we're talking about here in terms of community relations, in terms of completely changing the way we police our most challenged neighborhoods. And whereas this seems to be defined and achievable, there's a lot of other, a lot of other stuff which I'm very interested in. I mean, I love, I love, I think this morning's conversation was fantastic. Um, but it's exactly there that I start to get really hazy about whether or not my police organization or any, what they're going to be doing in that, and is that something that's, you know, it, what's achievable there? Are you from New York? Well, I, I'm from Long Island, uh, but now now I'm in Baltimore. Well, do you want to answer? Well, I think what you're saying is a really interesting question. Um, <clears throat> We can reimagine policing on a lot of different levels. And I guess to me, one of those levels is that the police become more active in the community. When I first went to Washington and I talked with police chiefs in the COPS program, one thing police chiefs kept saying is, you can't arrest your way out of crime. That what you really need is you need the police to encourage development in the community, economic development, social development, so that the community basically lifts itself up and crime becomes less of a problem. And I think the police are uniquely situated in many communities to do that because they actually are the people who know everyone in the community and have a connection to all the power sources. So could we imagine the police moving in the direction of being not just about arresting people, not just about crime, but creating conditions of reassurance, creating conditions of perceived safety that lead people to engage, helping communities to bring together different partners for economic development, social development. And those are not ideas that came from me. Those came from a lot of police chiefs in meetings in Washington about 21st century policing. But if we think about that as a goal, then there's a, a long way to go. Once we have trust from the community, we can get cooperation with the community. The police can be the people that really lead the way to improving the community. 
Uh, and to me, we, they've kind of talked about it, how we're at a unique opportunity here. I kind of, I really believe, and I don't know if it's karma or whatever, but everything happens for a reason. And you can either take what happens and you can boo-hoo it, or you can look for opportunities. And we have an opportunity right now. A lot of bad stuff has happened. We've, we've had some, some bad shootings by police officers of, of men of color. We've had police officers in New York City, brother police officers who've been assassinated for nothing more than sitting in their car, maybe being picked out because they were white or something. Well, I think one of the officers was actually uh, Oriental or something. But bad stuff has happened. But we have a chance right now, if you're gonna create change, now's the time to do it. And, and there's a dialogue here, there's opportunity here, people are, are talking about this. Um, and I, I think any police department can do anything. This is not a panacea. Procedural justice training is not a panacea. This is not going to get, you're not, that's what I'm saying, it's not a checkbox. You're not going to get to training and your department's going to go out there and go, wow, this is, you know, we're procedurally just now and everything's going to be great. It, it's a start. And we need to start somewhere. And I understand what your concern is, but instead of saying, where can we go? Let's say, where can we start? And let's just start going and see where it leads uh, and take this opportunity to do this stuff. And I'll tell you what, police officers are receptive to this. Police officers, we talk about how when they come on the job, that most police officers, 90, over 90% of police officers become police officers because they want to help people. And there's a frustration that goes on out in the streets because they feel like they're not being able to help people. And that's because we talked about this, this history that's going on of, of oppression. And we just, all we do is when we do, when police officers mess up, all we do is reinforce the stereotype of police officers. And we have an opportunity now, at least to start, you know, at least to start to start. And that's where I think we should go. But I think most police officers like that. We have police officers after class that come up and tell us, you know, thanks. You kind of reminded me why I became the police. That, and, and I've lost sight of that a little bit. And um, when we teach in the history part, a lot of officers don't know the history of what happened in, in America for 300 years or, or for 100 years or 50 years because some of their parents weren't even born 50 years ago. You know, the Voters' right, Rights Act was only passed in 64. If you were born in 1960 and you've had kids who are now become police officers, their parents were four years old. So telling them the history, giving them the history, giving it's a start. It's a start of a start. And I think we just got to go from there and see where it goes. But you'd be surprised how many police officers actually like this. And I don't know the guys from Stockton, two or three days older than that, is that. So let me add real quick, too, that the question about whether police officers support justice and legitimacy is probably answered in Dennis Rosenbaum's NPRP research, which shows about 80% of the officers, when asked and understand what justice is when they're asked, they support it. So great news. But from a police chief's perspective, I think what is very important to the point you raised in a slightly different angle is, all right, now what's going to happen? Police officers, let's say, all became incredibly good at explaining why we're doing what we're doing. I'm looking forward to that day because then a tremendous amount of pressure is going to be pushed, pushed back to the legislative bodies that pass all these laws. See, police officers are constantly caught in the crucible of American society, but they're enforcing the laws that are the will of the people as expressed through the legislatures. And when are we going to start thinking through that? Another example of it, which is something I'm very, very involved with with a lot of other chiefs, and it's about this issue of mass incarceration. I've known a lot of police officers, and not a single police officer joined a police department to give a homeless person a life sentence one day at a time in jail because the government stopped providing care for their mental health issues. Now, if you want to really get under the skin of police officers, ask them, why are we the only ones at 2 o'clock in the morning that are being told that now, since we've received 40 hours of crisis intervention training as directed by the Department of Justice, magically the problem of mental health illnesses in America have gone away? Clearly, a better trained police officer results in a safer engagement with someone who has been lost by the system because of their mental health problem or because of their addiction problem. Police officers don't want to be putting all these people in jail. If people don't want taillights as an illegal violation, then tell the legislature. So this justice and legitimacy thing is going to have one huge backlash, I hope, so that we can collectively as a people maybe look at a lot of these laws that officers are simply enforcing for what, that's the, the good case. I know people are doing bad things. I know people make bad decisions as cops. But a lot of cops just out enforcing laws that people don't like, okay, then fine. Just, that's good then. If that law isn't important to society anymore, take it off the books. But somebody's asking that officer to enforce that. That's why they're doing it primarily. Thank you. Thank you.
Somebody's telling them, look, I don't want to be in an automobile accident and the person I'm in an accident with doesn't have registration, doesn't have insurance, doesn't have a proper authority to drive because now I'm out in this accident. So you see what I'm saying about this issue that if the officers explain more why they're doing what they're doing, I think it'd be great for the public to be better informed that Mr. Jones under the overpass is being arrested, not because I'm a rhubarb that hates Mr. Jones, it's because there's nothing else for me to do with Mr. Jones now that he's acted disorderly in your neighborhood. And the only tool I have left in my toolbox is not a sobering center, not a mental health facility. The only mental health facility that still exists in America is what? Everybody say it with me? Yeah. Your county jail. So maybe it isn't the police officers who are treating the nation in an unjust way, or certainly not alone. Other questions? Just a quick comment that, um, you know, what I'm capturing from what you're saying is, you know, how do you apply your adoption in the police department for these new practices? It may be that a lot of these meetings are perceived as being from the top down, but there may be a curriculum that's designed that starts at the cadet level in the academy, so that there's a bottom-up approach that can capture this discussion in a way that gets folks on their way into the we teach our academy, every recruit that goes to the academy in Chicago gets this training. Yeah. So it's, it's an all-inclusive book, Danielle. Yeah, the cities that have done the training in, uh, in California, it's in service as well as the academy with some changes, recognizing that um, they haven't had years on the job. Would, but, would the copies of the curriculum be available to us? Sure. And what I've been doing is trying, and I've been very lucky to be able to be an advocate of Tom's work, because I spend a lot of time talking to police chiefs about it either as the vice president of the Police Chiefs Association or now as a professor, I spend a lot of time going to organizations of police chiefs. And so I'm taking it from that point of view. Let's get these chiefs' heads wrapped around what this means as an issue for them, too, because they've got to agree that this is something they want to take on on behalf of their department. And then they get into Bruce and they get into all the brilliance of the training at the street level. And I, I'll tell you this, though. If you're a recruit, you go through the academy and we give you procedural justice training, these recruits come out and they feel like, man, I'm Superman, I want, I'm want, i gonna save the world, I got the big red S on my chest, and they go to roll call, um, and you know, they're getting you know, put down by their, their sergeant, and the sergeant's telling them, hey kid, you know, that's all bullshit, you can't, this, you're not gonna do anything, you're not gonna make a difference, I mean, it's gotta be, it's gotta be from, it's gotta be, the entire department has to be talking like this and thinking like this. Um, when we were at the academy, people come in and say, you guys are always talking about procedural justice. I'm like, well, yeah, I mean, is, is it, isn't that good? Isn't that how it should be? That this is we're talking about how to how to bring this into training and, and, and how we can make it better. Other questions? Yep. Yeah, I'm uh, Danny with the Fort Worth Police Department. And I guess one of the questions I have is I understand that training is the, the the beginning of this process, but what kind of departmental changes, either structural, process, procedural changes, have some of the departments made to support the training? So like it, so, okay, so yeah, you know, in the, uh, I think the thing that was impressive is that in New Orleans, we took the training out to the officers and we used each one of the six month returns on the surveys to function all the leadership through that, to bring the leadership of the police department in. And the survey firm that we used provides like 110 debt slide power debt. Yeah, a PowerPoint slide. So you can get into each precinct, you can get into the patrol areas, you can get into the types of responses, and then start crafting plans of action that would have to be filtered down in through the organization. And then guess what? Six months later, you're going to come back, you're going to see the same data set again, and it's going to look different, or it's not going to look different, and you have a chance to build. Um, I absolutely don't think we were good at it by the time I left, and we need to get better. But that's what we were doing with the leadership. And I recognize that a lot of that didn't have to do with the officers as directly as I would like to have now. Admit. I, I think there's certain departments. I think Oakland with Paul Figueroa. Paul Figueroa is just outstanding. I, I, I think uh, Oak Chattanooga. Um, but I think a lot of departments need to look at this. Like, like I say, this is not a checkbox. You just don't do the training. You have to look at yourself in the mirror and say, am I doing enough to incorporate this into the culture of my department? And it, again, you can do it very cheaply and simply. And I, and, I think, the, I think the problem is we're still all catching up with this. I mean, we sat down with Tom and Tracy in March of 2012. So that was, what, three years ago. And we were kind of, I mean, at the time, we were out there. So I think everything, the, the caboose hasn't caught up with the rest of the train yet. 
So, but I think everybody, it's a lesson everybody has to look at. Look at your department and see how, it, how you culturalized it. I don't know if that's a word, culturalized, but that's, that's what I'm using to, to get there. That's kind of what I'm curious about. I know, I know locally we have the Arlington Police Department that is incorporated a procedural justice training. And they talk about you know, celebrating the, like the, the achievements as far as like their commendation systems and stuff, that they'll, they'll publicize it, award it. And that's why I'm looking at different ideas on that, how you would incorporate it into your culture. I have a lot so, of ideas. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, two areas that often come up for officers are discipline and pay and promotion. So departments are rethinking transparency, openness, representation in disciplinary hearings, giving officers a chance to come in, like in one department, if someone is accused of a disciplinary violation now, the chief meets with them, talks to them, basically is saying, I want to hear your side of the story. And so that's an effort to change a disciplinary procedure. Officers often feel that pay and promotion is completely opaque. And so you can make those procedures more clear. You can give officers more of an opportunity to present evidence. You know, why should I be promoted? or at least help them to understand what the rules are. So those are the kinds of things that different departments have tried to do because officers have often pointed to those as things that they don't think are fair within their own department. And an angle to that is that there has been more and more use of mediation. And this also, I think, speaks to this question about having the opportunity for each side to explain to one another, right? The whole purpose of this is to better communicate the departments that have been adopting mediation for disciplinary low-level hanging fruit, I mean, I think they're going to go in the right direction because you sit down, you, you talk to the person that you stop, they talk to you, they tell you what's on their mind, you tell them what's on your mind, and it's a much more mature way of dealing with discipline and the bulk of American law enforcement discipline, believe it or not, again, for fear of being beaten up in a barroom, the bulk of disciplining in police offices is misapplication, misunderstanding, or miscommunication of policy, procedures, and laws that they were enforcing. Wow, that was good. <laughs> I'm glad you got that on tape, because I couldn't say that twice to save my life. But no, really, I mean, that's what discipline is. Misapplication, misunderstanding, or miscommunication of policy, practice, or rule. And if you can sit down with two sets of adults, the person aggrieved and the officer, and you can talk through that, almost always everybody comes out feeling better about it. Most importantly, it's a cop. And, you know, well, I was just going to actually lift up what you mentioned earlier around um, uh, personnel evaluations and measuring the um, delivery of procedural justice. So the policies that Tom mentioned make a lot of sense. And then also um, measuring um, and recognizing that way of working in a department to lift it up as, as the way that the department does business. Like I say, putting the four words, the four tenets in your mission statement. I know Chicago just included questions on procedural justice in their latest lieutenant's promotional exam. Um, you have posters in your roll call rooms with the four tenants on it. This mm -hmm. is how we do police work. Mm -hmm. uh, just remind people, it's gotta be out there, it's gotta be in front of them every day. Um, has it been inculcated into your, uh, uh, into your procedures? Um, again, awards for people who do procedurally just things. Uh, there's just a, a, a lot of different little things you can do that are very cheap to, you know, promotion, making your pro promote people who, your supervisors who, are, who have exemplified procedural justice. It's that how they, how they do things. So that your younger officers can see that as examples and as mentors of how to do procedural justice. Uh, so there's lots of things that, that need to be incorporated into it. And, and I think a lot of times, and, and I think this is a police culture, this is not blaming anyone, but I think a lot of times it's like train, 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 train. You, you listen to MSNBC or CNN or, you know, oh, we've got to do more training, got to do more training. And I just, it makes my head want to explode because training is not the answer. It's a start. But there has to be, we talk culturally about how, um, we tell people, you know, Ronald said that about how we're, you know, officers are told. You know, the, the thing in New York with, with, the, with the gentleman who was, they put a chokehold on, those officers probably weren't out there arresting him for no tax on the cigarettes for no reason. I'm sure some store owners called the, the, their local alderman or whatever, complained that there's a guy out here selling cigarettes without tax stamps on him. He's taking business away from me. Do something about it. He probably called the precinct captain or even maybe to the, to the commissioner's office, the commissioner's office called and said, this guy's out here on the street, he's paying taxes, do something about it, and cops went out there and did something about it. You know, and in hindsight, they said, well, do we have to do this? Do we have to arrest this guy for selling cigarettes? Well, 
that the police officers have a choice when they're told by their supervisors, this is what you gotta go do. So I think this is something we have to look at in terms of, it's a big picture, it's gotta be looked at. I'd like to tell you that um, police chiefs are savants and police officers are savants, and we always know which neighborhood to be in, and we always knew where we're supposed to, look, that's not, a way, that's not the way it works. And you know, Bruce brings up a really good point, and it's kind of a topic on this issue of unconscious bias and biases that I absolutely believe exist, by the way. I don't have any question in my mind that it exists. But it also exists at the neighborhood level, too. Because a lot of times, they're the ones that call the police. Does not excuse any mis misbehavior, but I mean, think about it this way. How did the police end up in so many of these neighborhoods? They didn't figure it out by themselves. We've begged people to call 911 systems, we've created Omega Crime View, we've created callback systems that don't identify the complainants so that they can feel safe in their neighborhoods. We have, as a police chief for 14 years, we begged people to call us. We didn't beg our officers to go in there and do stupid things, but we begged the community to call, and guess what, we, and guess what they do? They call us a lot, and they should. So there's also, sometimes we've got to read through that bias just as well, because the description we get is going to be whatever that person in that community saw that made them uncomfortable. And the police, you know, using justice and explaining that, I think is going to help us. But again, it's also got to reflect back to the community. It's got to reflect back to the legislative process. And I'm not trying to justify what the officers did. I'm just saying the whole reason they were there was because they were told to be there. And, and can we change that? No. This is fine. Other questions? Just have uh, maybe one comment. Uh, I'm a DA, not a police. I've read the why, why do people cooperate? Why are they available at all? I'm wondering why we're not talking about firemen or EMS personnel now. And what I sense is that they have a very clear lane. Uh, they're calling them because they want to be saved. And when the cop has to show up, which hat are they going to wear now? It's really, their lines are so blurred. It makes it real difficult with this legitimacy. Although there's a lot of good things we can do. But I really think that going with the chief said maybe we need to narrow down their focus and it makes them a whole lot more legitimate, at least a lot easier. It really has to be easier you know, if a fireman wants to to a house. No, it's really funny because whenever police chiefs get together, they seem to enjoy saying nasty things about firefighters. I was going to say it's because they're doing their posing for the calendars, but since you brought it up. <laughs> <laughs> so we do need to identify a clear mission and then work on how it gets achieved. We had a question yes. up here. This concept on, on the best trying to introduce the problem, which is where the women are at it. Uh, this concept of procedural justice, do you find that it works better with a certain amount of uh, a force with a certain amount of members? Uh, you know, I don't know, New Orleans, how, how big is how big of a force in New Orleans? We were around 1,600 and drop, but remember, I, I do really believe this, especially as you dive into the literature and you think back and reflect on your experience. Every cop ought to be doing this. It doesn't matter how big the police department is. It doesn't matter whether they're, I mean, I mean, think about it this way, too, and, and I haven't read Tom wrote about this, and I might have missed it, but think about how critical it is for homicide detectives to adopt this type of thinking. Sex crimes detectives, child abuse detectives, fraud, the forgery, you know. Ma'am, I'm explaining to you why I'm doing what I'm doing. This is why we do the job we do, and I think that applies whether you're in a 35,000-person police department like New York or anywhere in the country. Yeah, and um, it doesn't matter the size of the department. One thing I always talk about is in training, because if you have a small department and you want to get your whole department trained, you have a 10-man department. So I think something like 75% of the departments are like under 20 people or something. It's like most departments are small. So to take a person off the street, that means you got to pay someone else overtime to cover. So the cost of training isn't just paying the instructors. The cost is also the overtime you have to pay to cover, you know, it's because you have someone out there. But I, I think it. I don't think it matters. Everybody, every police officer I've ever talked to, they, 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 small departments, big departments, we're all the same. Anybody else? If not, can, Bruce yeah. Lipman is going to finish us out with a story. Well, this I is, don't know what's coming, <laughs> but it's going to be exciting. Uh, no, it's not. But actually, I walked down to Times Square last night, uh, and uh, interesting. I don't know if anybody spent the Times Square, but it was very interesting. Uh, Especially coming from a big city, and then you go down there and say Chicago's not that big after all. Uh, but the police officers out there is pretty cool because there's all kinds of police officers out there, 
And they're posing for pictures. I swear, there was about 100 people getting picked, more than 100 people. I was actually, they're asking me, I'm talking to one of the coppers. I, I'm sorry, you call them coppers in New York? I, but I was talking to one of the coppers, and um, we were having a real nice conversation. And people are coming up and asking me to take the picture. I'm like, hey, I'm a retired police officer, too. I'm like, I don't know, we went to New York. So anyway, so <laughs> and, and the police officers were very gracious and stuff, and they had smiles on their face. In fact, I took a picture of them getting a picture taken. But I was talking to an officer, and he said, you know, what are you here for? And I told him about procedural justice. And, you know, he says, oh, that's, that's interesting. He told me a story. He says, about two weeks ago, they got a call of a man with a gun, a description of the car, a male Hispanic driving this kind of car. He's heading this direction. Uh, and he says, so he's driving around, and lo and behold, he sees the car, and they had the plate. He sees the car with the plate, the description of the car, and there's a Hispanic male driver and two other occupants of the car. And so he says, you know, like, oh, most cops would say, oh, like, oh, shit, it's, you know, it's on now because you've got a man with a gun call. So he comes out, he gets his gun out, which is proper. Um, he approaches the driver, and he says, put your hands up on the steering wheel. And the driver says, well, can I get my wallet? He goes, no, you need to put your hands on the steering wheel. He's got his gun out on the guy, which he should have. This is a man with a gun call, and he's about 100% sure this is the car. So he, uh, he gets the driver out. He does everything he's supposed to do. Gets the driver out. The driver has a screwdriver in his pocket. And he starts talking to the, the police officer. He says, well, you know what? I was fixing the car over here. The neighbor lady is kind of like a busybody, and she gets kind of mad. She probably called in because she didn't like me fixing the car in front of her house. Uh, any police officer from here probably know what I'm talking about. So he's talking to the guy. He gets the other guys out of the car. There's no gun. The guy says, well, why would you pull me over? And the police officer says, well, the, your car, this is the car. They called on. And he, had, he called dispatch, and he asked dispatch, dispatch, can you replay, can you tell me, Give out that description again and give the license plate number. He let the guy listen to it on his radio. The guy says, oh, geez. And he says, well, I'm sorry, officer. I'm sorry to cause you so much trouble and stuff like that. And the officer, after he relaxed, hey, that's not a problem. I'm just doing my job and stuff like that. The guy shook the officer's hand, said he was sorry, and, and they parted that way. Now, to me, that's procedural justice. He told him why he stopped him. He did his job. Tracy Mears, when we, one of the last things Tracy said before we left is, tell him it's not Huggett Buck. Um, <laughs> He did his job. He did it safely. He did it professionally. He told the guy why he was stopping. He even gave him some proof of why he was stopping him. Right? He treated him fairly. He treated him respectfully. He was open with him, which establishes trust. And at the end, they shook hands. And the guy said he was, you know, he apologized for inconveniencing the officer. To me, that's procedural justice. And it, and it was just last night I was talking to this guy. I've got his picture. If you don't believe it, that was in Times Square. And that's a story I'm going to use now because I think it's so, and he, and he even said that he knows a lot of police officers who don't tell people why they stop. They just, you know, shut up and just obey me. And he says, no, I believe you. He says, I, I do that all the time. I always tell them why I stop them and I get much more cooperation. So I got a good example. This is the best example of procedural justice ever. Be a police officer working by yourself on Bourbon Street in Mardi Gras. <laughs> you better be making some friends. Um, well, with that, uh... it took a minute. Huh? It, it, it's just laying out there. Y'all are getting. They're gonna get you. They're gonna get you. Later um, tonight at the bar, you're gonna say, "Oh, he was so funny." <laughs> <laughs> we are so incredibly grateful to our panelists and to all of you for taking the time to participate.